most of the time, and sometimes I'll deviate off and say, just for our first off, wish, wish everyone a happy Father's Day. Um, and those of you, all, everybody here I think has had a father, and I know they're not always good and things like that, but just remember happy Father's Day for all the fathers. And, um, and this message is not just for fathers, it's for all of us. And it's from Paul's writing his letter to the church of Philippi, and he has, um, in prison, but he has heard some things, good things about the church of Philippi, but he also wants to encourage them, but he wants to give them some guidelines. And i got to find my thing that makes it so I can turn that thing around. There we go. So we'll open it. If you got your Bibles, open to there, Philippians. And it's chapter 2, starting with verse 14. All right. Page whatever. Do everything without complaining and arguing. You guys have heard this one before. So that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life, that on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain. Paul did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. And that's what his prayer is for each one of us. So it's like a light shining in the darkness, and Paul is talking about this. Um, and you know, I've told you many times the blessing of being in the country, and I don't have a yard light. Uh, I've got some battery-operated, rechargeable lights that go on, but I can cover them up very well. So uh, when the moon's out, out, I can see lots and lots of stars. And, it's always fun there to just watch and sing. There aren't any nice bright ones out right now because you got to get up early in the morning to see Jupiter, I think, or Venus coming up, and there's nothing in the evening. But there's just all kinds of other star constellations, all kinds of things to watch out there. So I enjoy watching out there. And Paul is telling us that we are to be, the word is like a light, it's a witness. And when you look up at the sky and see all those bright lights, it's just those lights are so much brighter if you don't have all the other lights in the city and all the other things conflicting with you. And the, why does Paul want us to be a light? Because he says in his word, we just read it, the world is crooked, perverse, perverse, and it's a dark place. And we're seeing that, aren't we? We've always seen that. I suspect the Jewish people and the Christians at the time of the Nazis were seeing a dark place. And people in Africa and different places, different parts of the world have seen that. But it seems like it's not... I think it's the first time in history that a worldwide virus shut down, not only taking people's lives, but it shut the economies and everything down. So there's a thing that's going on. So Paul wants us to be lights of the world. We have seen it in the past week, and then also with the decisions of the Supreme Court, actually two of them, that are contradictory to what I believe God's word is. So let me ask you, how do we shine as lights in the world? In verses 17 to 30, I'm going to read. Paul will give us examples of three men who show us different aspects of what it takes to radiate light. And the first one is going to be Paul himself. But I, Paul, will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want you all, all I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice, and I will share your joy. True light is what Paul is telling us, self-emptying. Paul wanted nothing to left behind. And when he talks about, he talks about the sacrificial system of drink offering being offered along with a burnt offering. This is from the Old Testament times. You want to look at it, it's at Exodus 1940. In the, in the Old Testament, occasions of uh, the wine offering would be poured out onto a very hot altar. And the wine would be consumed and would disappear. It would burn up, so to speak. There was nothing left of the wine. Paul wanted his life to be like that wine. He wanted his life to, quote, disappear. But that he would, there was nothing left behind. Paul was not looking for ways to hold on to his life. But he wanted his life to be poured out. So my question or situation for you, are you in? Are you willing to be poured out? As Paul was telling us in those scriptures. Or would you rather want to hold on? Would we rather have our comfort, uh, our savings account, our 401ks? How about your profession or your job, your vocation, of what you're pursuing? Maybe your security, your home, your possessions. Do we hold on to all that stuff? Are we into stuff? Do we 
meet him. Um, I heard it, I think it was on the radio when I was coming into town. There was a speaker talking about, we put all, no, it was, uh, I heard it just this morning. You take and get a whole, a whole bunch of stuff, put it in a box, and then you spend your time protecting that box. Don't you mess with my box of stuff. I've accumulated it, it's mine. So, evaluate. Would you rather hold on to the stuff or pour out what God has given you? And there's a scripture from Romans 12.1. This is kind of a little rewording of it. The spiritual darkness of the world will never be pierced, grab a hold of, by the light of the gospel, which is what we're supposed to do, unless God's people are willing to give the life God has given us, he's given us life, back to the Father as a sacrifice. So decide, you want to hold on to it, or you want to pour out what God has given to you. Okay? It's a decision we all have to make, and we all have our ways of doing it, of things have. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with having stuff like a 3D printer that makes stuff for me every once in a while. My granddaughter from South Dakota hollered for a bunch of things. When I wear my mask, I have a thing in back of it so I don't have to have it over my ears, and it holds it in place, and she hollered for a whole bunch of long ones of those because whatever masks they have have short reins on them and stuff like that. So, so I get to play with that a little bit. So then... We're going to look at verses, true light is self-denying is the next part. And you'll see in a minute, but we're going to look at 19 through 24. Same, chapter 2 in Philippians. If the Lord Jesus is willing, now he's going to talk about Timothy. Or Timothy's going to say, I hope to send Timothy to you soon for a visit. Then he can cheer me up by telling me how you guys are all getting along. I have no one else like Timothy. Paul and Timothy were, yeah, they were like this who generally cares about your welfare. All the others care for themselves and not for what matters to Jesus Christ. But you know how Timothy has proved himself? Like a son with his father, he has served with me in preaching the good news. I hope to send him to you just as soon as I find out what is going to happen to me here in the prison area. And I have confidence that the Lord, that I myself will come to see you soon. True light is self-denying. Paul is telling us about Timothy. He tells us how Tim, I like to shorten the words up once in a while, is sincere about the welfare of others. Verse 21, Paul states, others care only for themselves and not for the matter of Jesus. How do we care for others sometimes? Do we just look out for ourselves or want it to look good so other people see, oh, I'm taking care, I'm donating, I'm giving this or that? Or are we doing it because Jesus Christ has asked us to do it? The set, sets of two billion, and this is just kind of round numbers. There are two billion people on this earth that do, have not heard the gospel. It's getting smaller, believe you me. If you've got revival in Iran, China, North Korea, other parts of the world, they're getting the gospel. There are two billion people that have heard the gospel that have rejected it. Again, I'm just giving you round numbers. There are two billion that call them themselves Christians. Christians. But how many of these Christians know the bio, know the Jesus of the New Testament and the gift of the Holy Spirit? It's a question we all have to answer. You can I can no longer be preoccupied with the pursuit of our own interests, of the me. We need to be concerned for those who will spend an eternity without Jesus. The two billion that are hearing the gospel, the two billion that have heard it but rejected Jesus, and the two billion that need to be on fire for the Lord. Let's read Saul, or Philippians 2, 25-30. And this one's called, True Light is Self-Sacrificing. Meanwhile, I thought I should send you, then help me, Epha Prodidas. I'm going to call him Epha for short. Back to you. He is a true brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier. It's the only time we hear about him is in the, this little short scripture in the gospel. And he was your messenger to help me in my need. Obviously, he was part of the church. I'm sending him because he has been longing to see you guys again. And he was very distressed, yet you heard he was ill. And he certainly was ill. In fact, Epa almost died. But God had mercy on him and also on me. 
so that I would not have one sorrow after another. In other words, Paul was in prison. He didn't want to have somebody die while he was in prison. So I am all the more anxious to send him back to you. Back to him. In other words, he departed the church and he came to him. For I know you will be glad to see him. And then I will not be so worried about you guys. Welcome him in the Lord's love and with great joy. And give him the honor that people like him deserve. People like him deserve. For he risked his life for the work of Jesus Christ. And he was at the point of death while doing for me what you couldn't do from far away. In other words, he was able to do some ministry for Paul. True light is self-sacrificing. Epa was willing to risk everything for what Jesus called him to do. And it's the only place that he was found. What makes Epa stand out was that in the last verse we were reading, Epa risked his life for Jesus Christ. So obviously he did something. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to stand up and say when somebody says whatever it might be, and you have to say, oh, that's not what God's word says. And as soon as you say that, there are people out there that say that has no place in this world, has no place in our lives. It's just a figment. It's just somebody that's out there, but he really doesn't care, but he does care. The Greek word used for risk is life is like to roll the dice. That's what Epa did, is he rolled the dice in standing for Paul. He took a stand. He says, I'm standing for Jesus Christ. He was willing to risk and lose everything for what Jesus called him to do. Are you, am I, willing to make that sacrifice? It could be our lives. It could be our livelihood. It could be where we live, because we'll be stuck in a prison, like Paul was. Summary of this. Be the light. Paul is telling the Philippians those three different ways to be light. We are to be self-emptying. Empty of ourselves. Give up everything that we have for the Lord because He is the one that's given us life first. Self-denying. Are you protecting that box of stuff you got? Or are you pursuing what Jesus wants you to do to help? Like we did that offering today for good to the hood in Minneapolis. To give them money. Nancy, how much was it today? 255. 265. Generous offering to send up to them. You are giving of yourself to give money to the Twin Cities, to Minneapolis, St. Paul area, to help with feeding. And as you read that, or saw the video on it, they not only just feed them, but they're helping them to be self-sufficient. And then like Epa, rolling the dice. Are you willing to give up your life? With, and we want to do this. Be the light with our lives. We are to be with our lives. As a church, and as a follower of Jesus Christ, we need to be very aware that there is a price to pay to follow Jesus as we bring light to the spiritual darkness in this world. If you don't believe it's there, and I hardly ever watch the news on TV or listen to it, it's there. The risk that we take is how Jesus is glorified and the light will shine more brightly. We need to take that risk of being the light so that Jesus is glorified and will shine more brightly. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that Paul's letter to the church at Philippi is a letter for us today. Were we to be self-emptied, to give ourselves, to give of ourselves because you first gave us life, and then to be self-denying, to, you know, we all have our boxes of stuff, let's be honest. And we hang on to it, we've accumulated it, the different things, even maybe our jobs are different things. But Lord, help us to do what you want us to do by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you, and then to roll the dice, so to speak, just a phrase, to say, I'm going to take that stand. I'm going to stand firmly, Lord, for what you say. I'm not doing it out of anger. I'm not doing it out of spite. I'm just going to speak your truth. Speak it when you tell me to speak it. So I pray that for each, more, each one of us this morning, Lord, to pray to follow Jesus as we bring light 
to the spiritual darkness of the world. Amen? I'm going to read a little phrase from there. I'm going to finish up. Matt, do you have a song for the end? Okay, why don't you come on up and I'll just finish off. With other. One thing that we've been kind of promoting, and I'm working on it, I just can't do memorization like I used to in the old days. Psalm 91. I want to tell you a little story about Psalm 91. And I'll just start do the first verse. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. The Miracle of Prayer. F.L. Rawson, noted engineer and one of England's greatest scientists, who is the author of Life Understood, narrates an account of a British regiment under the command of Colonel Whitlesey, Whitlesey that served in World War II for more than five years without losing a soldier, a man. This unparalleled record was made possible by means of the active cooperation of the officers and men, all of whom memorized and repeated regularly the words of the 91st Psalm of Protection. I want to encourage you. Do it. Take time. Yeah, like Roger said, do it! <laughs> by constant reiteration and repetition of the truth contained in Psalm 91, the men in Colonel Whitt Whittlesey's regiment acquired the feeling of being watched over by an overshadowing presence. Hmm, wonder who that was. Mm -hmm. By repetition, faith, and expectancy, these truths sank down into their subconscious mind, bringing about an in inner conviction of divine protection at all times. This is one of the miracles of prayer. Thank you, Lord. So take Psalm 91, print it out, put it in your billfold, put it someplace, Try to memorize it. It's 16 verses long. Looks like yeah, each, each, six, each verse has two parts to it. So take time. And then when you guys got it down, September, let's say September, the first full Sunday in September, we all do it together on a memory. <gasps> I put a challenge to us. Oh, oh. What, uh, probably have to all do the same version. I do NLG again, but pick whatever version. It'll be the same with the thing. So Beth has a song for us. <laughs>